But it is a blessing to be here, and I'm looking forward to what God has for us this morning. Let's open to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. We'll begin reading in verse number 1, Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding His twelve disciples, He departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, He sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I want to draw your attention to verse number 7, when Jesus says, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. I'm going to ask Pastor Jay, brother. Pastor Jay, will you open us in prayer and ask the Lord to bless the message for us? Amen. You know, before Jesus' ministry, before he was ever rejected, John was rejected. And we have John the Baptist, a great preacher, a great man, that gets put into prison for preaching. Herod has John locked up. He's in prison. He had been real popular, but now he's in jail for preaching the gospel. He did right, but he's done wrong. He followed God, but he wound up in jail. And the bad thing about it from John's perspective is he hears all the things that Jesus is doing. He hears all about the works of Christ and how Jesus has all this power to heal people, to raise them from the dead, to do all these great things. Yet it seems like he doesn't have the power to get John out of jail. And John, at a low point in his life, does what we all, and says what we all think from time to time. Lord, are you really the one? Lord, why are you leaving me in here? He questions God. And I want to, before you're too hard on John, I want us to try to consider things from his viewpoint for just a minute here, how that he has basically given his entire life for Jesus, and now he winds up in jail. And so before we're too hard on John, let's try to walk in his shoes and realize that was a tough pill to swallow. 
For him to preach right and to get thrown into jail like that, that's hard. And so he questions God. And Jesus Christ uses wisdom, of course, when he answers John. He sends word back and he makes a statement in verse 7. What went you out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Now in Palestine, along the Jordan River, these reeds would grow about 12 feet tall. And these reeds would be all along the river. And as the wind would blow and the rains would come, the wind would bend these reeds over. And the wind would blow the reeds over, but then the reeds would pop back up again. And so he's comparing that. If you'll notice in verse number 6, he says, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And then in verse 7, he mentions the reed being shaken. I want to submit to you this morning that you can go through your Christian life and the wind begins to blow. The storms begin to come in life. And if you're not careful, you're going to be shaken up. You can be shaken with the winds of adversity. You can be shaken with the winds of temptation. You can be shaken with the winds of trials in your life. We just came to camp. We had a great time on the mountain. I believe God came on top of the mountain. I believe God ministered to our hearts. God did something for us. But as we come down in the valley, the wind begins to blow. And the wind wants to blow away the realness and the genuineness of God in your life. And it's easy for that to happen. And so sometimes we can be shaken by the wind. I believe John has a problem because he has the winds of disillusionment. The winds of disillusionment. In Luke chapter 3, when John is asked, when he first starts preaching, they say, who are you? And he goes, I'm nobody, I'm just a voice. Of course, I don't know if he got like me, he didn't have much of a voice left. I'm just a voice. But he says, I'm just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's all I am. He said, what are you doing out here, John? He says, I'm fulfilling the prophecy. We're going to make the mountains, we're going to flatten them out. The crooked places, we're going to make them straight. The rough places, we're going to make them smooth. Because Jesus is coming. So his ministry was to plow, to preach, to plod along. And things went good for a while. The crowds came out. They asked John Wesley one time, they said, "What? Why all these people come out to hear you preach? He goes, I get on fire for God and people come to watch me burn. You do what God tells you to do. Leave the results up to Him. John did what God told him to do. The crowds came out. They followed. They wanted to hear the truth. They wanted to hear the preaching. They wanted to hear about the Messiah who was coming to deliver Israel. But now things are different. His position is different. He's not on the mountainside preaching with big crowds. Now he's in a jail cell with no congregation. He's not on the mountain with multitudes. Now he's in a jail cell with rats and mice and bugs. And now his perception changes. I don't believe he was offended by Herod. You know, Herod had him put in jail. He told Herod, he says, it's unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. John preached against sin, amen? We need more preachers to stand up and preach against sin. Some things are still wrong. He said, well, preacher, the world is changing. The human heart hasn't changed. The human heart is still deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You haven't changed. And you know what? God hasn't changed. He's still holy. He still says it's still wrong to commit adultery. It's still wrong to fornicate. It's still wrong to covet. It's still wrong to have idolatry. It's a sin. And John the Baptist points the finger at Herod and says it's not lawful. Herod puts him in jail, but John, he, he expected that. He's not offended at Herod. He's offended at Jesus. Jesus let it happen. I dare say we all believe in the power of God. God can make certain things happen and stop certain things. I believe we understand that we're taking a breath in our nose and we're exhaling out of our mouth because God gave us the ability to do that. I'm able to eat today because God gave me some teeth and God gave me a stomach. I'm able to drink today because God gave me the ability to taste and to drink. I'm able to put one foot in front of the other because God gave me the strength for that. 
God could start things and God could stop things. And John is offended because of his position and that affects his perception. Because of where he is, now he's beginning to think differently because he's been shaken up. It's easy to shout on top of the mountain. Amen? But when you come down in the valley and everything changes and you go back to school and you go back to work, and you get back around family that's not saved, you get back around friends that are not saved, you get back around the pressures of this world, it's easy because your position changes, and that affects your perception, what you see. And now John's in jail. You see, it's called delusion in psychology. It's called fixed false truths. You begin to see things and think things that aren't true. That's why your preacher here and your pastors here, they emphasize the truth in the King James Bible. If you don't believe the right things about God from the Bible, you're going to think the wrong things. And it will affect you on a day-to-day -day basis. You better believe right about God. Well, you know, my Paul Paul, he just always said God did such and such. Or my Mom Mom, she just always said this is what God... No, you better know what God said. Well, God just loves the sinner and hates the sin. That's not in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Bible. The Bible says God hates all the workers of iniquity. What is in a sinner except sin? All these little cliches. You better think right about God from the Bible. John got in a position that changed his perspective. He didn't understand there had to be a cross before a crown. He thought he was preparing the way for the Messiah and he was ready for Jesus to take over the Roman authority and for Jesus to rule and reign and he didn't understand. And so it shook him up. The winds of disillusionment will shake your world. The winds of discouragement. The winds of discouragement. No more preaching, John. What happens, John, if I take your voice away? What happens, John, if I put you in jail? Will you still praise me? What happens, John, if I affect your health? What happens, John, if I affect your family? Discouragement. Winds of discouragement, winds of disillusionment, winds of disappointment. He's disappointed. He thought he was going to see the Messiah usher in the kingdom. But now all he sees is an executioner coming to take his head. Corey Ten Boom, most of you probably know her story of a, a Christian during the Holocaust and different things. She made this statement. I've learned never to hold on to things too tightly so it doesn't hurt so bad when God takes them. I've never learned to hold on to things too tightly so it doesn't hurt when God takes them. Everything belongs to Him. You get your roots too much in the world. Some of you are too worldly. You're tied into the world so much. You've grabbed on to the world. Now the world's grabbed on to you. When God begins to take it away from you, you scream and cry out. You never should have had it to start with. You need to grab a hold of God. Now in reality, it's not just John that gets shook up. John's not the only one. What about Elijah? Y'all remember Elijah? The great mighty prophet Elijah? I mean, he went to Ahab and he said, Look, we're going to have a contest. I'm all about games. Amen. Sound good? <laughs> I'm all about games. Elijah says, Let's have a contest. You get the prophets of Baal, get on top of Mount Carmel, and we'll find out who the true God is. So Ahab goes and gets the prophets of Baal. You know the story. They get on top of Mount Carmel. He says, look, you call on your God. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Well, they went out there and they cried and they prayed. And they did the rosary. They did all kind of stuff. They cut themselves. They cried out. Elijah made fun of them. Yeah, make fun of them. They make fun of us. Make fun of them. Amen. The Christians have went in the closet. Make fun of them. Look, you're stupid. Prophets of Baal calling out 
Look at you. There's no God that's going to answer you. And then Elijah goes out, and you know what happens? He puts the altar out. He repairs the altar of God, uh, the altar of the Lord. He calls. He pours out the most precious thing they had. There's always got to be a sacrifice. Worship always involves sacrifice. Sacrifice is connected to obedience, and it always costs something. And you'll notice he pours out the most precious thing they had, water. It was a drought for three and a half years. And he says, you get water and you pour it out. They poured that water out and he said, okay, God, I've stuck my neck out. God, I have really done it now. Please answer by fire. The fire comes down, looks up the altar. And you know what happens? Elijah, he gets with Ahab and he says, don't let any of those prophets escape. He took that organization and he made it a non-profit organization. Amen. That's what he did. Everything's great. And he says, you know what? God's going to send some rain now. We finally turned our hearts back to God. He's going to send the rain. And everybody just gets all excited and they leave, leave Elijah. And there he is. Next thing you know, he gets a little Twitter. He gets a little Facebook notification. He gets a little text message from Jezebel. The devil himself. Amen. Why would anybody name their kid Jezebel or Delilah? I've heard of people being named Delilah before. Can you believe that? That's like naming your kid Judas. Come here, Judas. But Jezebel sends him out a little tweet and says, Hey, you killed my prophets and you chopped off their heads. Your head's going to be just like them tomorrow. What does he do? He takes off and runs. He runs from a woman. And he slides up under that juniper tree. And he says, I'm no better than my father. Take my life, I told you. You ever been up under the juniper tree? I've been up under the juniper tree. You get discouraged. You get shook up. You get off balance. You act out of character because of the storm blowing in your life. And because of the temptation in your life and the trial. And then you slide up under that juniper tree. Well, when you're under the juniper tree, look for the initials down there. You'll see a lot of great saints. I get, you'll see Dr. Ruttman's name under that juniper tree. Amen. He had tough times in his life. No Christian goes through life without being shook up from time to time. He gets down there and God meets him under the juniper tree. What about Moses? Moses comes out of the land of Egypt. And if you read the book of Numbers, I have nicknamed the book of Numbers the book of slaughter. Every time you turn around in Numbers, God is punishing and killing and judging his people. I mean, it's tough. Every time you turn around, they're complaining. They're griping. They're belly aching. In Numbers chapter 11, Moses gets so sick of it. He says, Lord, I can't bear all this burden of Lord. Lord, I pray you just kill me. The Lord says, hold on a second, man. Hold on a second, Mo. Hold on, Mo. You remember back there when Jethro had all this idea about trying to get all these other people to help you? He was ahead of me. You can handle it. But now I am going to put some of the burden that you have on these other elders. And God comes through and God blesses and helps Moses at that point. What about David? Many, many times in David's life, I think of one specific place in 1 Samuel 30. When David goes out, him and his men are gone. They're going to go try to fight with the Philistines. That goes bad. They come back to Ziklag. The Amalekites had come down and invaded the land and had taken captive all of their families. So here's David there with all of his men. All their families have been kidnapped. They started whispering and talking. He could hear tell some of them were conspiring to have a coup to overthrow David, and they spake of stoning him. What did David do? He take off running? No most. But the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He didn't encourage himself in himself. He didn't say, okay, David, let's pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You are somebody. No, he said, God, I need your help. God, these people are about to throw me out. I'm about to lose everything. Lord, I'm really getting shook up about this. I need some help. Abathar, he says, Abiathar, come over here, bring the ephod. And he asked God for some help. I'll give you one more and we'll move on. What about the Apostle Paul? 
I think about him and Silas when they go to Philippi and they're preaching there. Things are going good for a little while until the authorities show up. The authorities show up and say, hey, you can't be doing this stuff. And they take them and they rip their shirts off their backs and they begin to beat them and they beat them, the Bible says, with many stripes. Then they take them and they put them down in the prison house, in the prison, and they put their feet in the stocks. They're all bound up in jail in the prison house. What does Paul do? He begins, I believe, begins to pray. It turns into praise. And it turns into singing. And then God begins to answer. We need some Christians that will sing at midnight. It's easy to sing on Sunday morning. It's easy to sing for applause. It's easy to sing three hours at camp. Well, maybe it ain't so easy. After your voice goes. But it's easy when... The cool breeze from heaven's blowing down. But when it's still and it's dark and you're in a dungeon, it's hard. I think Paul probably started praying. And of course, when you pray, you know, the Bible says in everything, give thanks. So your prayer shouldn't just be supplications, asking for things. Your prayer should also be thanksgiving. So part of your prayer should be, okay, God, I'm thankful. And Paul's in stocks. He's locked up and he's, okay, Silas, we've got to pray and we need to be thankful. And Silas is like, thankful for what? And he's like, well, thank God we're not in hell. Amen? That's a good start. Thank God my sins have been forgiven. That's a good start. Thank God he's preparing a mansion for me up there. Thank God we're going to see our loved ones that have passed on one day. Hey, thank God we might be alive when the rapture happens. You know, thank God that Hey, they gave us a little stale piece of bread, but at least we had something to eat. Amen. You can always find something to be thankful for. You can always find somebody worse off than you are, too. We need more Christians that will praise instead of protest. We need more Christians that will worship instead of worry. More Christians that will glory instead of gripe. Instead, we have Christians that say, I got my rights. God, what are you doing? I'm an American Christian. You owe me something. The Lord doesn't owe us anything. If he took everything away today, he's still been better to us than we ever deserved. Ever. Prayer led to praise and praise led to seeing the providence of God. You see, when Paul and Silas got to pray, and I believe they changed their perspective a little bit. And then God had shook up their lives, and he took their lives, which got shook up, and then he began to shake up the jail. And that thing began to shake up, and all of a sudden the doors were open, and that jailer, who probably had whipped Paul and Silas, who probably was the guy that put them in the stocks and had beat them, he came in there, and he had heard all the praying and the preaching and the singing, and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then the church at Philippi got started, because of Christians that had been shook up in their life. What a testimony. I read about this guy. And he was a survivor from a shipwreck. On an island. And he went over here and he got all the little pieces he could find. And he made him a little hut. And he had been there for a few weeks now. And he was learning how to scavenge and get food. And, and he built him a little hut. And he had some food. And, and he went out one day to get him some food. And he, was, he didn't know if he was ever going to be found or not. All of a sudden, a thunderstorm came up like we have in Florida. We have thunderstorms, a lot of lightning. A thunderstorm came up, and the lightning hit his hut. And he could see it from the distance, and the lightning struck his hut, and it went up in smoke, and that thing was burning. Everything he had gathered, it was all going up in smoke. And he just, he couldn't believe it. Well, not too much longer after that, a ship came by and rescued him. And he said, how in the world did you know I was out here? They said, we saw your smoke signal. See, God might shake you up because he's got another plan in mind. and He's going to do something with your life. Now, what does the Lord do here for John? I believe God gives him some reassurance. You know, when you go through this thing in your life, when you get shook up in your life, God will give you some reassurance. Notice in verse number 2, 
The Bible says when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ. I believe when Jesus answers John in verses 4 and 5, because what he tells him, he says, look, this is my answer to John. You go tell him what you've seen. Okay, John had already heard about it. So I believe Jesus is saying, don't question my works. You're not questioning my works because you heard about my works. You don't need to question my ways. John, you know how I work. Now you're going to see how I work in your life. And sometimes what happens is, we believe God can do all these things in other people's lives, but whenever He does things in our life, that's when we start questioning Jesus is telling John, verses 4 and 5, to quit looking at the prison cell and start rejoicing in what God's doing outside of the prison. And then he gives him a P.S., verse number 6. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Remember Elijah up under the juniper tree? The angel comes down there. The angel says, you know what? You're physically wore out. Why don't you get some sleep? Amen. It's good advice. I bet we came back from camp. Did y'all sleep all day when you got back? Fell out. You were out. Had to catch up. Teenagers, you know, they got they think they have to have 15 hours of sleep anyway. So they came back, conked out. You go to sleep. You need some rest. Then he comes in and he begins to make some food. I think he was making cornbread and bis cornbread and uh, and he had those uh, flapjacks and and he put butter on top of it and. He, he made some food for him. And he says, arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. Elijah had some misdirected vision. He thought he was all washed up, but he wasn't all washed up. Moses, you know, God put the burden on the other people. David, God answered his prayer. Paul, God shook up the prison house and he started a church in the very place he got shook up. God will give you reassurance. He's telling, he's telling John here, basically, look, don't be offended at me. You know what my works are. Now you've got to understand my ways. And don't forget the prayer you prayed and what you said in John chapter 3. Remember the great passage, John chapter 3? John gives his dissertation. He says, I'm not the Christ. And he goes through and he goes, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. He said, he must increase. I must decrease. John was of such caliber of a Christian, people thought he was the Messiah. Now, nobody's ever mistaken me for Jesus. And I don't think they've done that to you either. But John was such a great man, they thought he was the Messiah. And people were following John, and John's like, no, you have to go to Christ. You'll notice from the book of Acts that every disciple of Jesus was first a follower of John. They had to begin at John's ministry. They had to follow John first, and then they followed Christ. John lost membership. Christ gained membership. John had to understand the way up is down. The way to get is to give. The way to have glory is to suffer. He must increase. I must decrease. It was a brave thing, John said. It cost him his head. But it's better to have a head like John the Baptist than to have an ordinary head and keep it. Amen? You know, I like verse 7 because when Jesus brags on John, the disciples of John had already left. They leave and then Jesus says, what did you go out to see? Read shaking in the wind? Then he brags on John and says, of men born of women, verse number 11, of course, every man born of a woman, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist. You know, the Lord brags about John. I don't know, but I think, I really believe the Lord wants to be proud of us. The Lord wants us to do well at the judgment seat of Christ. I was preaching at camp and I told these young people, I said, we need to define define our life backwards. You need to look at where you want to end before you start the journey. You need to look at the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to give account to Him and serving Him. So now we define life backwards. And we live our life so that it would be pleasing to Christ 
and we will win at the judgment seat of Christ. God wants us to do well at the judgment seat. He doesn't want to have our works burned up. He doesn't want to say that we did bad. He doesn't want to say that He's disappointed in us. The Lord brags on John. He wants to be proud of us and to reassure us. You know, when you get shook up, you're going to have to come to a place that you're, you remove those false realities. Jacob, when he left Laban and he came going back home, he ran into Esau. And before he got to Esau, he knew he was coming. And Jacob was so overwhelmed and so upset about having to face his fears, having to face Esau, that he went out and he prayed, and then the angel of God met him, and he wrestled with the Lord. You know what he found out? He found the, out the problem wasn't Esau. The problem was himself. He shouldn't have been fair, afraid of Esau. He should have been afraid of the Lord. You need to face the reality here. The reality is not that God is against you. God's for you. But the reality is, He's the master, we're the servant. The reality is, He's the creator. He's the uncreated one. We're the creation. The fact of the matter is, He's the Lord. We're just servants. He's in control. He gives orders, we're to take the orders. You say, well, I don't like it. You're not supposed to have to like it. It's our job to serve. Job got shaken. You ever read the book of Job? One of the great things about Job is when you open it up, the very first two chapters, you see the back story. It's like you can pull the curtain back and you can see all the props behind the stage. And you can see the devil over there, the angels, the sons of God. You can see everybody talking and you find out from the backstage, the story, you find out what is going on in heaven that makes things go on in earth. Without Job chapters 1 and 2, the rest of Job wouldn't make sense. When you go through the book of Job, you know what you find out at the end of that thing? Job asks all these questions. Lord, if I had a place, I, could, I would sit down and I would set up forth my case. I would be an attorney. You know, oh, that I had a, 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 a pen of an engraver and I could engrave and I could write. You, know, you won't let me alone until I swallow down my spit. He goes on and on and on. I hold fast my integrity. I will not let it go. And he goes on and on and on. And finally, when he sees God, he repents in dust and ashes. <laughs> you know, when we stand in front of God, we're not going to say, why? We're not going to question him. We're going to fall down at his feet and say, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory and blessing. We're going to fall at his feet and say, you were always right. I was always wrong. God is right in all his works. Everything God's ever said is right. Everything God has ever done is right. God is always right. Here's another thing. We preach this at camp too. God is omnibenevolent. That means God is all love. God is love. Every decision God makes, there's love in it. You say, even a sinner going to hell? Why would God want to force somebody somewhere he don't want to go? God's not going to force an unsaved person into heaven. God wants them to make a choice. Forced love is not love. We love Him because He first loved us. When God makes decisions in your life and it shakes you up and it rattles your cage, God loves you. He chastens us, He whips us sometimes because He loves us. Growing up in the South, sometimes my daddy would whip me with whatever was convenient. Sometimes it was a peach, a peach limb, peach tree limb. <coughs> Them things hurt, man. And the bad thing about it was, when you get in trouble, they say, go get a switch. They tell the child to go get the instrument of torture. So I go over there and I pick this little bitty thing about this big, you know, I bring it back. You know, it's about that big. No, no, you don't want me to have to pick it. Then they go over there and they pull off a big limb. They got to use a chainsaw to cut it off. You know, it's this big old thing. I know. And then he and then my dad would whip me. But you know, I never doubted my dad's love. He never hit me out of anger. 
And most of the times when I got in trouble, he would say, I want you to go over there and think about it for a while. I think he did that so he would calm down. <laughs> so he wouldn't literally beat the tar out of me. Go over there and think about it for a little while. Think about what you did. I'm sitting over there, oh, man, I'll be, I'll be bad. Maybe he'll forget. Maybe he'll, he'll get busy, you know. And then he comes back, and he didn't forget about it. But he chastened me. He scourged me. He whipped me because he loves me. God loves you. If you're saved, you're under the love of God. You don't need to forget that. You have to replace those um, those false realities, you have to replace the flawed resolves, the priorities. You all remember Nebuchadnezzar when he exalted himself? Nebuchadnezzar was the great king. Then he had the vision, he had the dream, and the Bible says the angel came down and said, hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves. You know what God did with Nebuchadnezzar? He shook off his leaves. He shook him up. Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses seven years later. And then he says, I extol and magnify the king of heaven. You replace flawed resolves. You need to get your priorities right. You say, what's my priorities? His will, not mine. It's easy to say it's hard to live. If it means a prison, his will, not mine. If it means I go to that church, Bible Baptist International, and people make fun of me, his will, not mine. If it means I believe the King James Bible and I'm identified with some heretic like Peter Ruckman, oh well, his will, not mine. If it means my friends at school make fun of me, they laugh at me because I'm not on social media, they laugh at me because I'm not into the music, they laugh at me because I'm not into all the worldly things, that's okay. His will, not mine. He must increase, I must decrease. Ladies and gentlemen, humility is not being shy. Humility is not just walking around and being shy outwardly because a lot of shy people only think about themselves. They're worried what everybody's going to think about them. Oh no, I got a booger in my nose. Oh no, I didn't comb my hair. I didn't spend too long on my hair this morning. I hope it's okay. They're shy, but yet they're self-centered. They're consumed with themselves. Humility is not even thinking about yourself. You think about Jesus so much that it makes you think about others so much that you forget to think about you. We, and I include myself, are so stuck on ourselves. The problem with me is me. Don't look at me like that. The problem with you is you. Amen. He must increase. I must decrease. It replaces replaces flawed resolves. We put our priorities in a position that will make us better. Well, God, I'm going to do this with my life. Please bless me. God, this is the path that I want to go. Can you tag along? I sure want your blessings. I want to make a lot of money, and I want to be successful, and I want to have fun. Can you bless me? That's the wrong way. It should be God first. We are next. It replaces flawed resolves. We need to get back to where Jesus is in the midst. You ever see that thing? He's in the midst of the crucified. He's the one in the middle. You ever see that thing? He's in the midst of the camp in the Old Testament. You ever see that thing in Revelation? He's in the midst of the city. And he ought to be in the midst of the church. We're here because of Jesus Christ. His name's above every name. That in all things he might have the preeminence. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about the songs, it's not about the pews, it's not about the building. It's about Jesus Christ. The priorities. It replaces flawed resolves, it restores favored relationships. The Lord breaks us and shakes us to get us to the place where we see Him. And only Him. Now how do we respond? How should we respond to this? In times of testing, our first question should be, should not be, how can I get out of this? Right? We, we preached on temptation all week at camp. And I told you from the very beginning, you've got to prepare and plan because temptation is going to come. It's right around the corner. It is waiting for you tomorrow morning. And if you're not careful, it's going to hit you in the face. 
You say, well, I just need to, how can I get out of it? How can I, you can't get out of it. I wish we could, well, I don't really, but for the sake of illustration, I wish we could build a compound and just be separate from the world. I wish all you young people didn't have to go to secular schools. I wish all you adults didn't have to work secular jobs. I wish we didn't have to be around the evil in the world. However, we can't be separated that much from the world. Jesus said, I pray that thou, not that thou wouldest take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil. You can't affect a world that you never touch. God keeps us in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Temptation is going to come. Trials are going to come. How do we respond? Lord, I, take it away, take it away, take it away. God says, I ain't going to take it away. But what does he say? There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So our question should not be, how can I get out of it? Our question should be, what can I get out of this? God, what are you trying to teach me here? I've had the privilege to be around several men. One man's in my church. You probably know Brother Ted Warmack. has the Bread of Life course. He's up in years and he's had a lot of troubles, health troubles. His wife has Alzheimer's disease now. And he's had a heart attack. He's had open heart surgery. When I talk to him about his faith, he's always saying, Lord, what can I learn from this experience? I mean, he's written theological books. He has an honorary doctorate degree from PBI. And he's always asking the question, God, help me. Teach me something out of this. He's always looking for opportunities to witness when he's in hospitals and different things. He's always trying to learn. That's a great encouragement to me. Because my first response is, Lord, take it away. Instead, God says, that's where I want you. Lord, I don't want to go to school in the morning. Lord, I don't want to go to work in the morning. I don't want to be around that influence. God says, that's right where I want you. And I'm going to use you there if you'll submit to me. You know, when you go down the road a bit, sometimes you can get up to a high spot like we've got on the mountain. You can look back and see how far you've come. When you go through life, you need to look and see all the places God's delivered you through your valleys. See all the times God was there. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Look back and see those juniper trees and how that God met you there at the juniper tree and look back and see those jail cells and how God came in and shook the place up and look back and see how God ministered to you and get some strength out of that. You know, the trees that are the biggest are the ones who normally get blown down. When I was growing up in Georgia, we had a lot of storms. We had what they call straight winds. We had some tornadoes, but the straight winds, they were just real strong, like 60 and 70 mile an hour straight winds. And we had huge oak trees. We had one particular oak. It was big around as that communion table or bigger. And we, us kids, we loved the thing. We climbed in that thing. I fell out of that tree so many times, just wonder I'm alive. I'd be climbing with my older brother and my neighbors, and they were all older than me, and I'm trying to keep up. I'd fall on the ground, and they wouldn't even know it because the breath would be knocked out of me. I'd be on the ground going, they're up there playing, oh, I'm down there on the ground. You know. Well, you know what happened? We had one of those bad storms come in. It blew that big tree down, just ripped it up, roots and everything. That's one of the reasons my parents had bought the property. It was such a nice shade tree. That thing was blowed completely down. There are little trees by like this still standing everywhere. All the little trees that could bend, like palm trees. You ever see palm trees where I'm at? We have hurricanes and stuff. And the small trees, the hurricanes come. They bend over like that. After the eye of the storm passes over, the wind blows in the other direction. Then they bend over like that. When the storm's all done, they're standing straight up. They even can let go of some of their branches and let go of some of their limbs and it doesn't affect them. Because they're, they're able to bend. That's how we need to be. You might be a reed shaking in the wind, but just bend over. And when you bend over, you can bend over and worship toward the Lord Jesus Christ and bend over in submission to His will because He's got a plan. 
I don't know what God's plan is for our lives. None of us know the end. Aren't you glad you don't know? Trying to figure everything out? We are to live by faith. Christian life, not always easy. We see it early on in the Bible. Saint after saint after saint has trouble. They do right and have trouble. They serve God, they have trouble. But you know what? At the end of the day, God gets glory out of it. And if God can get glory out of my life, and God can get glory out of your life, what a blessing. Those are the things that the crowns are made of. Those crosses that we bear, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for you and me. And you take that cross and you take that crown of thorns and you wear that thing in this life, it'll turn into a crown of glory that fadeth not away. One day you'll be able to cast that at his feet. The Bible says when a man endures temptation, James chapter 1, that he receives a crown of life. Say, I want to die for Jesus. Well, I don't particularly want to do that. But it, sometimes it's harder to live for Jesus than it is to die for him. The same crown that's given to martyrs in Revelation chapter 2, I believe, is the same crown that's given to those who endure temptation. Whatever the temptation may be, a temptation of sin or a temptation concerning a trial, if you go through that with the right attitude, and you serve the Lord Jesus Christ and you submit to His will and say, you increase, I decrease, then you might get a crown of life. And what a day that will be to be able to take that crown and cast it at His feet. Amen. You've gone through a trial this morning. I want to encourage you. Get courage from Jesus' words. He's there. He never leave us nor forsake us. He wants you to decrease so he can increase and he'll use your life for his glory if you'll let him. Amen. Pastor Kim.